The Atlantic Rim area of Wyoming borders the western base of the Sierra Madre Mountains and includes the eastern edge of the Great Divide Basin. Muddy Creek and its tributaries traverse the region, flowing across valley floors and past steep-sided canyons. The area's seasonal streams and dense sagebrush created daunting challenges for emigrants seeking shorter routes across southern Wyoming. They're always looking for cutoffs. Oh, maybe we can go this way, it'll be faster. Sometimes they find they end up at a cliff or something. You know, it isn't faster. But they're always looking for cutoffs, which also accounts for why there is more than one Cherokee Trail in, in Wyoming. Prior to the gold rush and the creation of the Cherokee Trail, Emigrants traveling across Wyoming on the Oregon-California Trail often employed mountain men as their guides. These mountain men could guide them along these routes so that they could have a route that had plentiful water, plentiful grass, wood, all the necessities that an immigrant would need to survive himself and to keep his draft animals alive. You weren't going to get very far if your horses, your mules, your oxen ran out of water and grass and starved. In addition to using mountain men as guides, emigrants followed the advice of John C. Fremont, who led expeditions across the Rocky Mountain region. His guidebook recommended routes and offered advice about the region's many challenges. By the 1849 gold rush, a number of routes to California were available. Thousands of emigrants traveled the Oregon-California Trail across the Plain States and Wyoming. A more southerly route the Butterfield Stage Route crossed Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and Southern California. Another option was travel by sea. One sea route left New York and sailed to Panama, where passengers hiked across the jungles, then boarded another ship to San Francisco. Travelers could also take clipper ships around Cape Horn and the tip of South America. In terms of speed, they were pretty much the same. The fastest clipper ship voyage from New York to San Francisco was 89 days. The trip across the Oregon Trail would also take about three months or so. So it was, uh, you had a variety of routes you could take. It would depend on which way you would prefer to go and generally how much money you had to spend. January 8, 1849. We have received through the New Orleans papers such accounts from California as leave little doubt that the stories of the mineral wealth of the country, however exaggerated, are founded in fact. The whole valley of Sacramento may be said to be one vast deposit of gold, the metal lying in more or less abundance. Cherokee Advocate Newspaper. At the time of the gold rush, Cherokee Indians lived in the land designated as Indian Territory, later to become Oklahoma. The federal government had moved them there in the late 1830s from Georgia, a forced relocation of thousands that came to be called the Trail of Tears. When they had lived in Georgia, the Cherokees successfully mined gold and developed placer expertise. Now living in Oklahoma, these Cherokees saw the gold fields of California as a chance to improve their fortunes. When California has a gold strike, they say, why not us? Why not, why shouldn't we take up our beds and go and have a chance at this glitter and this fortune? Cherokees from the region and Anglo-Americans from neighboring Arkansas, Missouri, and Tennessee organized to make the journey to California. These emigrant companies soon joined forces. February 12th, 1849. There is one very great advantage in going with the Cherokee Company. The Cherokees are on the most friendly terms with all the Indian tribes of the prairie. Consequently, there will not be attacks from our Red Brethren. Cherokee Advocate Newspaper. Most of the Cherokees were very well educated. And those that came on the 49 and later on the 50s wagon trains, they were all Masons. They had uh, their newspaper men, newspaper reporters, doctors, lawyers. And so a lot of times, if you was a Cherokee, they'd say, when you join the wagon train, they'd say, here, you keep the books. Because, see, you could figure, you could write. The newly formed emigrant group became informally known as the Evans Cherokee Company, 
named for the Cherokee members of the company and the newly elected captain, Lewis Evans. With 129 members and 40 wagons, it would travel 1,300 miles to reach its California destination. Time was of the essence. Their shortcuts across Wyoming became their legacy. Their route was a little different from the Oregon Trail simply because they were starting off several hundred miles further south. Their route took them from Oklahoma west until they hit the front range of Colorado going through Bent's Old Fort. They would move north along the front range through um, what would become Denver until they reached the area of the Cache and Poudre River. At this point, the routes that the Cherokee Indians took split. Young men traveling with the company became impatient with the slow pace of the wagons. They determined to head off on their own with pack animals. June 18, 1849. The balance of the company have exchanged their wagons and teams for mules and ponies and will go through on packs. I entertain serious fears for their safety. They have 1,200 miles to pack from this place to California and in the van, not one man of experience can be found. Hiram Davis. As the young packers left them, the wagons led by Lewis Evans continued on a different route, entering Wyoming on the Laramie Plains. What uh, Lewis Evans and this Cherokee party got about as far north as modern day Rollins. Then they decided to head west, and this would take them right straight across the middle of the Red Desert a country which no one would want to take if they had the slightest idea of what they were going to get into because there was absolutely no water in the Red Desert. One of their members, a blacksmith named John Rankin Pyatt, wrote in his diary when the wagon train reached Fort Bridger. When we got to Bridger's Fort, we heard of our pack boys. They were about 20 days ahead of us. They left a letter for the captain there. They had bad luck across the Green River. They got one man drowned by the name of Gavin and lost many of their packs, saddles, bridles, and guns. Some lost all the money they had. A safe and short trail across Wyoming had yet to be found. Back home, word reached their families and communities of the perils encountered en route to California. Newspapers published the reports, which influenced the next prospective emigrants. Well, 1850, there's four wagon trains are formed in that area, two from Arkansas, one from Missouri, and, and an all Cherokee one. And they basically follow the same route to where they uh, get down to where Denver is on South Platte. And they had hired a French Delaware guide, Ben Simons, and of course, Ben Simons takes his whole family with him. And Ben Simons says, hey, I know a shorter way. We can go straight. Muddy Creek and its tributaries, including what would one day be called Cherokee Creek, flowed year round in the Atlantic Rim region, providing the water required by emigrants and their livestock. Grass, though sparse in dry years, was also available. As the 1850s emigrant companies approached the Atlantic Rim region, led by their guide Ben Simons. The members separated into different factions, just as the emigrant parties had done the previous year. Young men decided they weren't going fast enough and 14 of them separated themselves from this first group. The guide took them up to Twin Groves and pointed out the way for them to go. They became hopelessly lost. Saturday, June 29th, 1850. Our route has been through a sea of wild sage. Towards night, we began to doubt finding water, but found very good and plenty of grass. No stakes for our horses. Burnt wild sage for fuel. The wind blowed cold. The night chilly, requiring all the cover I could get. William Quesenbury. The passage over the Continental Divide reached an altitude of 8,100 feet. The Atlantic Rim terrain exceeded 6,000 feet, and snowbanks remained through the early summer months. 
William Cuisenberry, known as Cush, was an artist and writer who sketched his way to California and back. He and his fellow packers were about to encounter difficult days as they searched for passage. Sunday, June 30th. Got off early. The wild sage continued as thick and as troublesome as ever. Nothing but a barren, destitute country around. Nooned on a sluggish branch, where my pony mired in a few minutes, causing considerable trouble to my friends, who helped me out with him. He was dragged out with ropes. The other group of emigrants, with their wagons and guide, chose a different route. The 1850 Southern Cherokee Trail, which they created, used physical landmarks, called pilot points, as visual guides. From five buttes on the edge of the Sierra Madres, travelers could easily see the next pilot point, Flat Top Mountain. It's a very rough route. I've mapped the trail around North Flat Top Mountain, and it involves near vertical ascents of four to 500 feet, crossing the shoulder of the mountain, and then dropping down another 400 feet back down into the drainages again. John Lowry Brown, a Cherokee and member of the 1850 wagon train, recorded miles traveled by use of an odometer strapped to the wagon wheel. His diary describes passage across the Atlantic Rim area. July 10th. Traveled 25 miles today without finding water until night when we camped on a branch of Muddy Creek. Very bad road. Grass scarce and water not good. Camp 59. Today we had very good road for a few miles and then the rest of the way, the worst road that we have traveled ever since we left home. No water or grass or timber. The road dry and dusty and parched. No game, sage, grass, scarce. At sundown we reached the dry bed of a large creek where we got water by digging holes. Made 20 miles today. John Lowry Brown. This 1850 trail, and its many variants, came to be called the Cherokee Trail after its first travelers. Availability of water and grass influenced its use, and limited passage to a four to six week period in June and July. Packers and emigrants traveling by wagon would continue to use this portion of the Cherokee Trail for decades to come. 